Um, my name is Charlotte Argue. I'm with the Fraser Basin Council. We're a not-for-profit organization in the province of British Columbia, and we're a partner of the West Coast Electric Fleet Initiative. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we're going to be hosting the 2016 webinar series for the West Coast Electric Fleets, and on behalf of that initiative, today's topic is finding the business case for electric vehicles in public fleets. And we're going to have a couple of speakers today. Uh, Rebecca Abernethy is going to be talking about the Fraser Valley Regional District's involvement with, and procurement process of getting electrics in their fleet, and Eric Malia with Fleet Karma. Unfortunately, we had a last minute um, change and staff from the City of Victoria is no longer available to join us today, but Eric Malia will be covering um, their involvement with the business case for City of Victoria. Now, before we get into the presentations, I just want to go through a bit of housekeeping today. So everyone should either be connected to audio via their computer speakers or through the conference line, which was provided to you. Um, you can find information about the audio under the control panel, um, and there's a little tag called audio. So you should be able to click either your computer or the call-in line, um, depending on if you're on your telephone or on your computer. If you're having any technical difficulties, please uh, go ahead and type it into the organizers here. My colleague Brian Davis is with me, and um, he'll try to help you out if you have any issues. And that can be um, found under the questions or chat box on your control panel. Um, because we do have a lot of people attending today, we're going to have everyone on mute unless you're a presenter. So if you do have questions as we go, we do encourage you to ask those questions. Um, you can type those questions into the question chat box and we'll read through the questions at the end of each presentation and try to get through everything as we go. Um, but feel free to just type away as we are going and we'll address the questions uh, when there's time to do so. So before I pass it over to our speakers, I'm just going to take a, little, a few minutes to talk about the West Coast Electric Fleet Initiative. So it's an initiative of the Pacific Coast Collaborative in response to their action plan on climate and energy. This is an agreement between the states of California, Oregon, and Washington, and the province of British Columbia. And it was created to support cooperation um, and cooperative action in a number of areas. One of the actions or goals within the plan was this one, which was to take actions to expand the use of zero emission vehicles, aiming for 10% of new vehicle purchases in public and private fleets by 2016. So in order to help private and public fleets align with this goal and help support the transition to zero emission vehicles, um, the West Coast Electric Fleet Initiative was formed. Um, committee me members of this uh, initiative include members of the four jurisdictions of the Pacific Coast Collaborative, as well as several partners. So that includes ourselves with the Fraser Basin Council, um, and also a number of Clean Cities coalitions, Drive Oregon, CalStart, um, and others. Um, so I'm just showing you a map here of the current partner fleets of the initiative. So we're 30 and counting who span the West Coast. Um, in order to become a partner of West Coast Electric Fleets, fleets can sign a pledge, and it's free to participate. Um, we have a pledge set out to be accessible to fleets at various stages of electric vehicle adoption. So there's a pledge that's formed um, from everything from ONRAF, which is commitment to evaluate zero emission vehicles um, as part of their procurement processes, to the express lane, which is a commitment to procure at least 10% of zero emission vehicles for all of their new purchases by the end of this year. Um, and again, it's, it's free to join and the pledge is free to do. The commitment um, aligns you with the West Coast Electric Fleets Initiative and um, it provide support for a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, additionally, to support fleets with their goals, an online toolkit has been created that includes a vast amount of tools and resources, and you may have seen the poll at the beginning of this session. Um, resources include things like life cycle cost calculators and business case calculators, information about various incentives that are available, as well as available vehicles and products. Um, as, and in addition to that, there are a number of case studies to highlight the best practices and what other fleets are doing to increase their use of electric vehicles and zero emission vehicles. So this is kind of a key to this initiative. It's to, to support a peer-to-peer -peer network where fleet managers can support each other and share lessons learned. And that's 
again, the purpose of these webinars as well. So you can find on the toolkit uh, recordings of last year's webinars. There's a number of different things in 2015, um, and we have recordings of those online. So I encourage you to take a look at those. And we'll be continuing the webinar series in 2016 with a number of different topics. So um, again, thank you for participating today. And there will be others uh, throughout the year. So stay tuned on those. Um, I realize that there are a number of people who are participating today who are not on the West Coast, and that is absolutely fine. Um, the toolkit is there, and while there's some jurisdictional-based resources, a lot of it, or I should say probably the majority of it, would apply to any fleet, regardless of where you are across North America. So um, please do feel free to explore and participate, regardless if you're on the West Coast or somewhere else. Um, and the, again, the online toolkit is available for anyone everyone and anyone. So once again, thanks for joining us. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Ryan Davis, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, our next speaker is Rebecca Abernathy from the Fraser Valley Regional District. Uh, Rebecca was the main proponent in pursuing electric vehicle adoption, fleet electrification uh, for the Fraser Valley. Um, and she uh, was the environmental services coordinator. She'll talk a bit about the business case, going in detail about the Excel calculator that she utilized, and as well as uh, the business case report. Um, and at that, we'll turn it over to Rebecca. Great. Thank you very much, Ryan and Charlotte. And thanks to all of those who are joining in this webinar today. I hope that you find uh, the the story that I'm about to share with you that we pursued at the Fraser Valley Regional District in acquiring electric vehicles uh, helpful to considering uh, zero emission vehicles in your own fleet. So just to provide an overview of uh, what I'll be speaking about today, I'm going to start by uh, putting things in context and giving um, some background information on the Fraser Valley Regional District for those who may not be familiar with it. Um, and putting in context as well our air quality and climate change priorities in the region. And from there, I'll get into the narrative basically of how we came to become a West Coast Electric Fleet uh, Express Lane partner. Um, so I'll start by talking about the Community Charging Infrastructure Fund in British Columbia and how we participated in that. And then I'll go into more detail on the business case that we developed for acquiring electric vehicles in our own corporate fleet, as well as the acquisition and incorporation process that we went through. And I'll wrap up with uh, challenges encountered, lessons learned, and next steps. And again, hope that you can uh, take something away from that. So just to put things in context, the Fraser Valley Regional District is a regional government in southwestern British Columbia. So the map on the left kind of puts it in context with the geography of the West Coast. Um, we're quite a large region located about 100 kilometers east of Vancouver, uh, to put things in context. The uh, Fraser Valley Regional District is home to six municipalities, including Abbotsford and Chilliwack, which are some of the larger cities in British Columbia, as well as eight electoral areas. So on the map on the right, you can see those are denoted as A through G, and these are less uh, densely populated areas that the Regional District provides uh, local government services too. So our organization provides over 100 regional services to this entire area, including environmental planning and policy development. So while pursuing electric vehicles in our fleet uh, made sense for us as an organization, as I will detail, uh, to act um, as a leader in terms of reducing emissions and pursuing an option that's financially responsible for our organization, it also connected with our, our overall planning and policy work to um, reduce emissions across the community and to raise awareness uh, amongst the general public in our, in our region about electric vehicles. Um, so just a little bit more about the Fraser Valley Regional District. Uh, we have a population of about 290,000 people. So it's quite a large region, both by population and in area. And we're actually the third largest uh, regional district in British Columbia after Metro Vancouver and the capital region. And uh, the, the Fraser Valley Regional District 
uh, has an area of about 14,000 square kilometers and uh, by road from Abbotsford in the west to Boston Bar, which is located in the northeastern portion of our region, it's about 150 kilometers. So this provides um, a bit of a challenge with incorporating electric vehicles in our fleet because we're not a single municipality where it's 10 kilometers, kilometers to get across town or something like that. Our organization uh, serves all of the communities in our region and so there's quite a lot of inter-municipal or inter-community travel on the highway over longer distances. So um, I'm hoping that by sharing the example in our case where despite those distances and despite some highway and mountainous terrain we were able to to make the case for electric vehicles working hopefully in other situations um, you'll find that electric vehicles work in your fleet as well. Um, the Fraser Valley uh, itself is a mix of urban and rural lives. and in terms of our corporate organization uh, our head office is located in Chilliwack and head office has about 100 staff members and we have approximately 25 fleet members. So it's a reasonably small fleet and it's actually very exciting for us that now almost 10% of our total fleet is 100% electric. And I just wanted to showcase for those of you who are unaware that uh, the Fraser Valley is a beautiful place and if you hadn't had the chance to visit I would encourage you to do so and I'll do a little plug for Fraser Valley tourism. Um, so the major economic drivers in our region are agriculture which you can actually see in this image um, as well as tourism and so uh, one of the drivers behind electric vehicles is actually striving to reduce emissions um, across the region of both air pollutants and greenhouse gases. And from an air pollutant perspective, there are many reasons for doing so, but one of the reasons is that uh, air pollution in the Fraser Valley um, can actually impair visual air quality or visibility, and it can uh, reduce the vista, the beautiful vistas that you see on your screen that are so important to uh, residents and visitors alike. And so this, along with, as I'm going to talk about in a moment, some other air quality and uh, climate change priorities are some of the, the drivers behind pursuing electric vehicles in our fleet. So again, to put things in context, uh, the Fraser Valley Regional District is located in the eastern portion of the lower Fraser Valley airshed and that's what's depicted in the, the image below. Uh, so we're located in the, the eastern part of the funnel shaped uh, airshed which is shared with Metro Vancouver to the west and Whatcom County to the south. And because of prevailing wind patterns, at times uh, air pollutants can become trapped between the mountain ranges and particularly accumulate in the Fraser Valley uh, portion in the eastern end. Um, and so because of this phenomenon, air quality as well as climate change have been long-standing uh, priorities in the region. Um, there's a concern uh, for air pollutants from a human health perspective, environmental perspective, and visibility perspective as I outlined before. So because of that, the Fraser Valley uh, Regional District has long been interested in uh, reducing its own emissions and encouraging uh, the greater community to reduce emissions of air pollutants and greenhouse gases as well. And to further illustrate this point, and this was um, something that formed part of the business case that I'll talk about as well, um, we wanted to demonstrate that uh, motor vehicles or internal combustion engine vehicles are actually uh, substantial contributors to air pollutant and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so the figure on, or the chart on the left, shows that in the Fraser Valley Regional District specifically, although the story is very similar across the rest of BC, um, on-road mobile sources or vehicles on the road account for almost half of nitrogen oxide sources which is an air pollutant and on the chart on the right you can see again that mobile sources of vehicles account for about 37 percent of greenhouse gas emissions so as we know um, zero emission vehicles or in our case electric vehicles produce zero emissions directly uh, so they're environmentally attractive uh, from that perspective and in addition in British Columbia we're fortunate that the vast majority of our city over 90 percent is from hydropower so there are very little upstream uh, air pollutant and greenhouse gas emissions as well so this makes from an environmental perspective electric vehicles very attractive 
So I'm now going to transition into our story at the regional district and how we came to acquire several electric vehicles in our fleet. So our story starts in 2012 when the province of British Columbia offered the Community Charging Infrastructure Fund, which provided financial support to organizations, including local governments such as ourselves, uh, with funding to install electric vehicle charging infrastructure across the province. And through that program, we were able to install five level two electric vehicle charging stations throughout our region. So we have two located at our head office in Chilliwack that's pictured in the upper left uh, corner with the Mitsubishi IMEV and Nissan Leaf pictured. We also installed two charging stations at the Hope Recreation Center. Those are pictured um, below that. And then on the right, we installed one charging station at the in Boston Bar at Canyon Lanes Bowling. And so this was the start of the deployment of the charging network throughout our fairly large region. And others have, uh, have joined in as well. So as part of deploying uh, these stations, we also installed signage and pavement markings. So this uh, enhances the experience, and I would recommend that if you have public charging stations that you do so, it enhances the experience of EV drivers because it prevents um, or, or dissuades at least uh, people in non-electric vehicles from parking in those spots and accessing the charger. But it also raises awareness of anyone who is walking by uh, that parking lot and, and seeing these clearly displayed signs. It just heightens their awareness of, of electric vehicles and that they are out there. And uh, I'd also like to point out just something that we did that we found very, very useful and has been popular is that um, beside all of our charging stations, so if you look at the picture on the right, um, we installed an instructional sign on how to use the charging station. So this has become useful for people who might not have used a station from that particular network before. Um, it's also been useful with staff who are using our new fleet electric vehicles just to give them a reminder of how it works if they're unfamiliar. And as well as an instructional sign, uh, we developed some brochures that are in a weatherproof case um, just providing frequently asked questions and answers electric vehicles and uh, this is something that that passers-by have found interesting if they're wondering you know what this contraption is and wondering a little bit more about electric vehicles there's some takeaway information that they can access there and so this slide is just uh, again showing the the instructional sign that was developed and the, the pamphlet and uh, we found those to be useful in uh, enhancing our public charging stations so I'm going to delve into the business case uh, that was developed now uh, for fleet electric vehicles at the FBRG. So after we installed our charging stations in uh, 2014, there was a desire to consider pursuit of electric vehicles in our own fleet. So we wanted to do this to reduce air emissions. As I previously did, there's um, significant interest in that in the Fraser Valley. We wanted to lead by example as well and show other, both other fleets and just individuals that electric vehicles are here and they're a very viable option. And we also wanted to, to pursue and to investigate whether incorporating electric vehicles would actually have a financial benefit or cost saving to the organization. So uh, with all of that, my department, the department that I was a part of, the Environmental Services Group, was tasked with putting together a business case. And the business case was much more than crunching the numbers. Um, it ended up being a 30-page comprehensive document, and it covered frequently asked questions such as history of electric vehicles, their capability, both in terms of can they achieve highway speeds, what is their range, what are factors affecting their range, what are the safety records of these vehicles, what type of battery do they have, what is its life, what is its warranty, what is its replacement cost, and then information on charging infrastructure. So when we were developing the case in the fall of 2014, I was unable to find um, a document that, that comprehensively brought together all of this background information on electric vehicles um, as well as that tied it into to the business side of things of how much the vehicles actually cost on, on a life cycle basis. So that's what led to the development of the business case. And I'll just note right now as well that the business case itself, the full 30-page document, 
is posted under our fleet profile on the West Coast Electric Fleet's website. At uh, the very end of this presentation, I'll share a link uh, to where you can find that. But that, that full document is there, and I would encourage you uh, to check it out and to, to use whatever information on there may be of help to you um, as long as you cite us, um, the Fraser Valley Regional District, as the source of that information. <clears throat> so the business case also uh, detailed, as I showed earlier, the air quality and greenhouse gas emission benefits of electric vehicles. And importantly, it also incorporated a fleet needs and suitability assessment. So this is an important step to note that, to determine, are electric vehicles going to work in your fleet? Do they meet the needs of your fleet? And how we answered this is uh, we were fortunate in that our, our pooled fleet vehicles, so fleet vehicles that are available for all 100 members of the office to use, um, had for the past 18 or so months prior to the business case, had been collecting usage, usage information. So we know, knew where people were going and how long their trips were and whether they were using the vehicles for passenger vehicles or if they were accessing a, a remote trail on a 4x4 road or something like that. And what we found through the needs assessment is that 73% of trips, even in our large region, were less than 100 kilometers in distance. And we knew through research into the different uh, makes and models of electric vehicles available that many of them would be able to do at least a 100 kilometer um, trip. And so from that, and, and we also found through that assessment that most were used for passenger vehicle trips. So we knew that uh, electric vehicles could be viable and could work in our fleet. And the business case also incorporated a comprehensive financial analysis, and I'll spend some time in a moment uh, going through what we evaluated there. And finally, it looked at alternative options and in the end concluded that electric vehicles would be viable in our fleet. They would have air quality and greenhouse gas emission benefits as well as cost-saving benefits, and uh, it was concluded that we, we should consider pursuing them. So this chart um, is one example of a financial analysis that we completed um, for the business case for pursuing electric vehicles in our fleet. And again, this is presented fully in the, the business case, which is online with the basis of all of the numbers and the assumptions that, that went into it. Um, so you can see that what we did essentially is um, compared the life cycle cost of a couple of electric vehicle options. We looked at the Nissan LEAF and Ford Focus EV, uh, and we compared that to vehicles that we had in our fleet at the time. So that included a Ford Escape and a Toyota Prius, and we also compared it to a couple of other um, more fuel-efficient vehicles um, that we could consider. So as you can see, and again, this is walked through in the business case, uh, we made assumptions about the average annual mileage, and, and this 13,000 kilometer number is actually based from our own fleet data, so it's, it's a pretty sound number. Uh, we had an expected service life, the average uh, efficiency of the vehicle based on published data, um, the cost of the, the gasoline or electricity, um, annual insurance cost, and an annual maintenance cost, um, and also incorporated the the point of purchase price and a resale or salvage value at the end of seven years. And what I want to make a particular note of here is the entire business case uh, that we developed did not incorporate any government incentives because at the time it was developed there were no incentives for purchasing, purchasing electric vehicles in British Columbia and uh, we didn't actually foresee at the time that they would be coming back. So all of the numbers that are presented here are without government incentives. Uh, now that they're back in place in British Columbia, it actually makes the, the economic case for electric vehicles even more attractive than it already is as shown here. So what you can see, uh, if you look at the, the bottom line with the red box around it, is that over a life cycle, even a seven year, 13,000 kilometer year life cycle, um, the electric vehicles were comparable in cost to existing fleet vehicles. And in fact, the Nissan Leaf, for example, was slightly, um, cost slightly less over that seven year period. Um, so a number of different scenarios uh, were considered in the 
in the business case. Um, so we looked at uh, different um, annual mileage per year and different lengths of, of years of service. And uh, as, as is intuitive, what we found is that basically the more you drive an electric vehicle compared with an internal combustion engine vehicle, the more you save. And that's because the cost per kilometer um, of a zero emission vehicle is much lower. And uh, some of the numbers are quite compelling. If you look, for example, at scenario four, if you compare the 10-year, the 20,000-kilometer-a-year uh, 20, scenario, the Nissan LEAF actually ends up saving you approximately $15,000 compared with the, the Ford Escape. So that's, that's quite a lot of money and is uh, financially attractive. And something that, uh, that I did note in the business case is that um, most electric vehicles, including a LEAF, have an eight-year warranty on the battery. And so in this case, over 10 years, even if, you know, unexpectedly you needed to replace the battery, we have information on replacement costs right now. Nissan has presented that. The replacement cost of a battery is about 5500 US dollars. So even in the unlikely event that after an eight-year period had lapsed, after the warranty had lapsed and you needed to replace the battery, you would still have a financial saving relative to an internal combustion engine vehicle. So um, based on uh, the comprehensive business case, our, um, it was presented to our board of directors in the fall of 2014. They accepted it and they directed staff to consider um, electric vehicles the next time fleet vehicles needed to be replaced. And the other thing I'll note on um, while we're talking about the financial aspect of the business case is that the, the Excel spreadsheet essentially or the fleet tool calculator that was used to, to develop the financial case has been modified a little bit and it is now available uh, for presentation on the West Coast Electric Fleet website under our um, our fleet case study, and again, I'll provide the link to that at the end of this uh, of this webinar. But basically, you can can utilize the same methodology that I did and incorporate uh, different scenarios to suit your own fleet's needs and determine what the financial picture would look like for your fleet. <clears throat> so I'll move into acquisition now. Um, so as luck would have it, after the the business case was completed in the fall of of 2014, uh, several vehicles in our fleet needed to be replaced in 2015 and uh, in the end we actually had two out of six vehicles replaced uh, were 100% electric so 33% of our new vehicles in 2015 were electric which easily enabled us to become a West Coast Electric Fleet Express Lane partner um, which only requires 10% and uh, more than just pledging to do it, we've actually done it. We have the vehicles in place and uh, in June and September of 2015 respectively, we obtained a Nissan LEAF and a Mitsubishi iMeV in our fleet, which are pictured below. So there was a little bit of legwork involved in integrating the vehicles into our fleet. It wasn't as simple as, uh, as putting out the tender, procuring the vehicle and, and adding them in. Um, because these vehicles are available to, to the pooled fleet and to the entire staff in our office, to 100 or so people, many of them had never driven an electric vehicle before we obtained these. And that's another benefit uh, we saw in obtaining the vehicles is that it offered a large number of people the chance to try and experience an electric vehicle, hopefully, hopefully have a good experience doing so, and you know share their experience with their friends and family and thereby help to get the the word out in the community about electric vehicles. So to, to make the experience of, of trying an electric vehicle and using it in the fleet as uh, seamless and straightforward as possible, we did a couple of things. So one of the, the uh, training aspects that we completed was the development of an instructional video uh, that was shared with all staff in the office. And it basically went through the the frequently asked questions of how do you actually operate one of these vehicles? How do you turn it on? What sort of things do you look for when you're about to go on a trip to make sure you have enough charge? Um, how do you plug it in when you return from your trip? And what do you do in the unlikely event that, that you run out of electricity while you're driving around? So we, we prepared that video and shared it with our entire staff. 
Um, we also developed what's shown below a quick guide, which is a, a it was a two-page laminated sheet, and it just provided you know a very brief overview of how do you start the car, how do you plug it in, who do you call if something happens while you're out with it. Um, and again, because these are are pooled vehicles, some people may only drive them every month or two, so they're not inherently familiar with them all the time. So this just provides a very quick reference and, uh, and it's just a bit more friendly than having to flip through the large um, the large owner's manual. And similarly, the detailed reference guide, which is pictured on the right, was a little bit longer and it just provided more answers to questions such as tips for driving more efficiently and maximizing your range and also gave some information on uh, different charging stations in the community, the different charging networks and how to utilize those if people wanted to give them a try. Another integral uh, component of incorporating electric vehicles in our fleet was one-on-one -on -one training. And how we did that is we identified um, a handful of champions in the office who were very keen about the vehicles, provided them with training, and then they acted as the trainers for the remainder of the office. And we just asked that everyone uh, set up a training session with one of the trainers before taking the vehicle out so that they knew how to, to operate it. They were confident and we also emphasized in a, a pooled fleet scenario, pooled fleet vehicle scenario, the importance of booking charging time for the vehicle after it was returned. So when someone books a vehicle, they need to book the time that they use it as well as adequate charging time afterward to make sure the vehicle is fully charged for the next person and just to emphasize how to, how to charge successfully. And I just wanted to make a note as well, I, I mentioned this a moment ago about charging networks. Um, most of our, our trips and uh, most of the utilization of our electric vehicles involves a round trip where the charging is done at our head office at home base and that's probably the situation for most of your fleets as well. But um, we did, for those who are interested or those who wanted to try longer trips, we did acquire charging network cards and fobs, a whole collection of them for the charging network in our area. Um, it just opens doors and allows people, if, if unexpected circumstances arrive, they can just easily plug in to basically whatever charging station they happen to come across. And a recommendation I would just make to, to all of you if you're considering this is to order all of these cards um, ahead of time because some of them take weeks or even months to come in. And we have a set, in our case it's three, uh, three charging networks that are frequently found in our region, a set of those cards in each vehicle and then a few spares as well. So just to summarize kind of the steps that we took to obtaining fleet electric vehicles, um, we didn't necessarily do them in this order, but I think if another fleet were considering them, uh, one of the first things I'd recommend is to establish a business case um, which needs to include a needs or suitability assessment to make sure that the types of electric vehicles or zero emission vehicles out there meet the needs of your users and pull together financial information and other relevant background information. And again, hopefully the business case that we've developed um, can be helpful for that. You don't have to, to reinvent the wheel. A lot of the information is pulled together already. If you don't already have it, you will need to install charging infrastructure at, uh, at your location. Um, many of you probably know that you can plug an electric vehicle just into a 120 volt socket uh, in the wall, which is a great backup option, but it takes a long time to charge. And if you want to maximize utilization of these vehicles, which you do because that's where you're going to obtain more cost savings, then you should uh, install at least uh, a level 2 or 240 volt charging option. As I suggested before, I would also consider um, the charging, different charging networks in your area. And if you're unfamiliar, um, a website that we've found particularly useful for finding other charging stations is plugshare.com. Find out what other networks are in your area and order the cards and fobs ahead of time because they can take a while to get in. Uh, you can then go through your procurement process, whatever that may be, for the, for the vehicles that you desire. Um, I'd suggest developing and implementing training to, to make uh, the users of the vehicles comfortable and to try to enhance the success of the take-up of the vehicles and then evaluate everything you've done and uh, 
adjust things as needed. <clears throat> so I just wanted to share a couple of challenges and lessons that we learned going through this process that may help you in going through it. Um, one challenge that we had in the development of the business case actually was concretely determining the actual annual maintenance cost for electric vehicles. Uh, how we found this information out, there's a, a wealth of information published from automobile associations about the average maintenance cost for conventional vehicles and of course our fleet, we had our own information from having, having fleet vehicles for many years but uh, modern electric vehicles have only been around for a few years so there's little information of real life experience of what the annual maintenance cost is for those vehicles. So what we did is we contacted a couple of other fleets um, in British Columbia and asked them what their maintenance costs had been in the first year or two of ownership of their vehicles and what we hope to contribute in the future is as our fleet and others have electric vehicles for longer, uh, we hope to contribute um, more information on what the actual maintenance costs have been, but regardless it's considerably lower than uh, an internal combustion engine vehicle. Uh, we also learned through this process that having very clear specifications on the tender documents um, is useful. We actually had to go through two tender processes uh, because of, of some issues with clarity, so I just recommend being very clear about the battery capacity, for example, that you want and the charging rate that you want in your vehicle. Research the vehicles ahead of time. Um, know which types of vehicles will meet your needs and, and uh, direct your tender appropriately. We also found uh, that significant training and championing was needed to, to actually implement uh, the electric vehicles in our fleet, uh, but this offered the opportunity for many different staff members to try and, and to give more people an experience of driving an electric vehicle. Uh, we also have found that having reliable community charging infrastructure throughout the region uh, is very beneficial and that's something that we're continuing to, to work with our member municipal partners on. Um, so we found that while most of the trips we do can easily be a round trip um, on one charge. It gives uh, staff um, a lot more comfort uh, to know that they can plug in at their destination, particularly if it's fairly far away. So some of our, our destinations, uh, such as Hope, I, I showed that um, the Hope Recreation Center has a couple of, of charging stations at it. It's about 50 kilometers from our office, so the round trip there is about 100 kilometers and users who don't drive the vehicles all the time, it makes them a little bit nervous to embark on such a trip if they couldn't charge, but knowing that they can charge at their destination gives them a lot of confidence. And of course, enhancing community charging infrastructure also helps with EV adoption amongst the general public as well. And finally, one other thing that we've learned is that in an ideal scenario, having one dedicated charging station per fleet vehicle would be optimal. Um, so what we have right now is two public charging stations that are available to the public and we have two fleet vehicles. So occasionally there, there's an issue where a fleet vehicle will come back and a member of the public will, you know, fairly so, be charging. And so in order, again, to, to maximize utilization of the fleet vehicle and minimize the number of times somebody has to go out to, to check if the spot is free, is to have a, a charging station set aside for each fleet vehicle. And in terms of next steps, um, because the incorporation of the, the two fleet electric vehicles in our fleet so far has been very successful, they've been used, there's been a lot of positive feedback, uh, there is ongoing consideration for additional electric vehicles or plug-in electric vehicles for, for next fleet vehicles as they need to be replaced. Um, the Chilliwack head office is also having a direct current fast charging station installed and that's what the picture on the right is showing. It's being installed as we speak. This will be available for corporate and public use and that should actually alleviate some of the pressure on our level two chargers um, and, and just provide an additional service to the public. So that's something that's coming as well. As I mentioned before, we're continuing to encourage more regional charging infrastructure. This will benefit our fleet vehicles and benefit the greater EV community as well. And uh, something else that we'll also be working on is, is soliciting more feedback from staff on our electric vehicle program and, uh, and what they think of it. So I'd just like to conclude by 
thanking uh, the city of Chilliwack, Surrey, and Vancouver who provided information on their experience and maintenance costs with their fleet electric vehicles. Um, that helped in development of our business case. And, and thanks as well to the Fraser Basin Council for, for facilitating us being part of this webinar series and to the province of British Columbia for funding that got it all started, both uh, for the charging, uh, charging stations that were installed as well as the incentive that was introduced after we completed our business case. So thank you very much uh, for your interest and attention. I've just posted here our website where you can obtain some more information and email address uh, if you have any, any questions or would like to contact us. And finally, the, the West Coast Electric Fleet's link there um, is a direct link to our fleet profile. And there you can find the full business case as well as the fleet calculator that we used to, uh, to show that uh, fleet electric vehicles are actually a financially prudent measure and that led to successful incorporation in our fleet. So thanks very much. Um, I'm happy to take questions now if there are any. Hi, thank you, Rebecca. Um, in, the, in the constraints of time, we're going to go ahead and wait uh, for the Q&A until after both presenters today. I just wanted to remind everyone that your questions can be asked in the questions box on your right-hand side bar there towards the bottom. Uh, just type them in and we'll, we'll go ahead and feed those to the presenters at the end. Um, the next presenter is Eric Malia. He is with Fleet Karma. They're based in Ontario, um, Canada, and he'll be talking about the City of Victoria's fleet analysis they performed. Uh, the City of Victoria is off the coast of the, of the province of British Columbia on Vancouver Island on the southern tip there. Uh, uh, the City of Victoria had a multitude of policy uh, drivers that uh, they use to look at electrification of the fleet. Um, and uh, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Eric now. Great. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, I believe everybody could see my screen right now. So, Ryan or Charlotte, if you can't, please let me know. Um, okay. I'm delighted. Okay, great. So, I'm delighted to be sharing the story of the city of Victoria. Um, we, we took a similar approach to what Rebecca did with her fleet, uh, but leveraged some different technology to uh, come to the results that we did, and, and City of Victoria now is, is planning on getting electric vehicles. But let me begin there with the city and share a little bit of information um, that's, that I know about the city and working with them. So their population is about 80,000 people. The city proper is about uh, 20 square kilometers or the metro area is about 700 square kilometers. So relatively small city this, despite being um, a prominent city in the uh, province of BC area wise is, is pretty small. Um, back in 2013 we conducted an EV suitability assessment in partnership with the Fraser Basin Council as part of a plug-in BC program and at the time there was a clean energy vehicle rebate available of up to five thousand dollars for the purchase of a vehicle electric vehicle um, and the city was quite interested from a sustainability perspective realizing that they have a very clean grid that even upstream emissions associated with the electricity use would be minimal and that they could realize up to a 99 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emission potential from a battery electric vehicle. So it's a little bit of a background on the city. Uh, Fleet Karma itself for those who might not be familiar with our company uh, we have uh, over 150 clients now with, and devices deployed in uh, over 23 countries. Our main customers are in the utilities sector, the public fleet sector, um, universities, and some private fleets as well in the logistic or fleet leasing business. Uh, basically what we provide is a telematic system that is uh, unique because it is uh, one of the only systems where you can get uh, information on electric vehicles and use that to uh, manage the vehicles when you have them. And we also provide um, EV modeling software that we use uh, or clients use to conduct EV suitability assessments. And so that's what City of Victoria was able to do back in 2013 that led them to where they are today. So a little bit of background on that process. Um, Fraser Basin Council actually had worked with the provincial government in British Columbia 
to secure some funding to do these EV suitability assessments. Um, and we worked with nine different fleet operators, one of them being the city of Victoria. And the city received 29 telematics devices from Fleet Karma to collect empirical duty cycle data and conduct an EV suitability modeling exercise. Um, so the approach that we, we took uh, with the city of Victoria was very specific to each duty cycle, uh, understanding the operations of the vehicle in and understand, you know, would, would an electric vehicle not only be cost effective and beneficial to the environment, but would it be able to do the job each and every day that the gasoline vehicle is currently doing the job? So through the study, we actually found the line vehicles uh, would be economically suitable to be an electric vehicle and certainly environmentally suitable. But taking all things into consideration, 31% of the vehicles studied, or nine duty cycles, were found to be um, a great fit for electric vehicles. And that plan was to replace five motor pool vehicles, two pickup trucks would be reassigned in the fleet, and two smart cars would be reassigned in the fleet. The projective uh, savings would be about $3,000 per vehicle and seven tons of CO2 emissions. So when we were conducting the EV suitability assessment, the, the general objective that we were trying to understand is where does a battery electric vehicle or a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle fit within the port portfolio of, of the fleet. So the battery electric vehicles, we were really trying to find uh, duty cycles where there was sufficient range where you could get that great cost per kilometer savings, um, but not too much utilization where you may run out of time to charge or run out of range during the day. With plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, really looking for an application where um, you can maximize the electric driving as a proportion of total utilization to reduce the payback on the premium for the vehicle. So this is a snapshot of what a telematics device from Fleet Karma looked like to install in the vehicle. It just clips into the diagnostics port, takes a couple seconds to do that per vehicle. Uh, these were sent to the, the city and they installed them just in a couple days. We left them on there for about a month. Um, and then we use the data to model the suitability of electric vehicles in our modeling software. So this slide is a demonstration. It's actually a video to explain when we say modeling software what we actually are talking about. The vehicle highlighted in gray is a gasoline-powered Ford Fusion. Um, this, this vehicle would have a Fleet Carmen device in it. You could see the speed trace over one trip over 21 minutes long in the miles per hour and the fuel consumption over that trip. When I push play on the video, what we do in software in the back end of our system is we drive plug-in vehicles the exact same drive cycle, it's called, as the existing vehicle, and we use physics to determine how efficient that vehicle would actually operate and how much charge and fuel would be left at the end of the trip. And we do that for every trip that the existing vehicles make over a period of time, have a really, really rich sample to be able to predict the suitability of an electric vehicle in that duty cycle. So all the data, once it's processed through the modeling software, is available to the city here in a web portal. And you see a list of vehicles that were included in the study. They simply click on one of these vehicles, and it unlocks the report and uh, they're able to, to view all the information. So I'm going to show you two examples rather quickly. Uh, this is one of a 2003 Ford Taurus that was in the information technology department getting 18.1 liters per 100 kilometers. Um, you could see the most amount of kilometers it put on any given day was 82 kilometers and it spent about 35% of its engine on time idling. The daily utilization of this vehicle is shown in the plot below. Uh, the way to understand this plot is when you see green, this is when the vehicle's on, and we see black, that's when the vehicle's off. Each horizontal bar is a new day, and it's a 24-hour day from left to right. So you can see this vehicle is used quite consistently between 8 and 4 p.m., and ha would have um, no utilization overnight which actually is good if it was replaced with an electric vehicle, giving it lots of time to charge. Looking at how far this vehicle would go day in, day out, 
was around 40 to 60 kilometers in most days. You see a few that are a little bit longer, a little bit less, but we have a, a range capable graph, we call it here, to understand how far does the existing gasoline vehicle go and how far can any of these electric vehicles go given the particular driving demands in that duty cycle from the vehicle operator. So in the end, what we end up providing in a dashboard to keep it really simple for this duty cycle, which vehicles would be a suitable replacement? Would they be charge capable? Would they be range capable? What would be the environmental benefits? And what would be the annual total cost of ownership uh, savings compared to the baseline vehicle? So you see the baseline vehicle annually spending about $7,300 to own and operate that vehicle and how that would compare to electric vehicles when you factor in the incentives and the operational cost savings. Um, so in this case, uh, both battery electric and uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles were suitable um, for, for replacement of that Ford Taurus. Looking at another vehicle, a little bit smaller, is a bylaw enforcement vehicle, uh, Chevrolet Cavalier, model year 2003. The liters per 100 kilometers is 8.5. Um, the most amount of kilometers in one day, 42 kilometers less time idling, only 13.5% of the time. You see this vehicle is not used as much, far less green throughout the day, um, not as many kilometers day in day out. You can see the daily distance traveled ranging from um, around 10 kilometers up to about 40 kilometers a day, so a little bit less utilization. So in this case when we would compare the baseline vehicle to EVs, it wasn't the case that every EV in the list was um, economically beneficial and they had to be quite particular on what EV they would go with. So in this case the battery electric vehicles, some of the smaller battery electric vehicles uh, made sense but uh, some of the plug-in hybrids uh, would actually cost them too much from an annual total cost of ownership standpoint. In the end um, of the 29 duty cycles, again they decided that nine would be suitable for uh, electric vehicles. Um, we found that within those nine duty cycles, the vehicles, the electric vehicles would be range and charge capable 100% of the time. Uh, but to make the, uh, the economics work, they need to maintain a longer service life, at least seven to 10 years, uh, because of the low utilization in the small municipality. One of the things that they were able to do to um, to make it all work was partner with another municipality in a joint RFP and together they procured 13 electric vehicles, nine of which would go to the city of Victoria and four of which would go to the other municipality. And they're also installing nine level two um, charging stations uh, in, in various parking stalls as well. So that was the outcome of the study. Um, I know that they're very excited about it. Uh, the province of British Columbia again was in part responsible for funding this program to, to help support fleets. So we want to recognize their efforts. And just quite uh, just quickly with the time left, uh, there is my contact information if you're interested in anything that I shared there or uh, want to know more about the city of Victoria, feel free to email me uh, or give me a call with the information provided. But I'll leave it there and pass it back to uh, Ryan and Charlotte now. Thank you, Eric, for the presentation. Um, we're going to go ahead and roll right into the Q&A for you um, with uh, a question for Rebecca. Um, your business case uh, was really interesting. At any point when you were evaluating the cost of operating an electric vehicle on the long run, did you consider the probable increase in electricity prices? So the question is, uh, did we consider the increase in, in electricity prices or the price per kilowatt uh, hour of electricity? And yes, we did. Um, one of the scenarios that I didn't mention but is in the full business case is there was actually an inflation scenario. So I looked at probable inflation both on the, the cost of the vehicle and maintenance and what have you, uh, but also projected gasoline and electricity rate increases. Electricity in particular is projected to go up in BC, I think something to the tune of 28%. Um, I did look at that and again, playing with um, predicting the future a little bit, we projected at the time that gas uh, would actually probably increase more in the long run. 
and uh, we still concluded the same thing that uh, financially electric vehicles should be uh, more cost effective over their life cycle even with electricity prices rising. Great. Uh, question for you, uh, Rebecca, is uh, from David. Will the uh, DC fast charger in Chilliwack be on the connected network? I actually don't know the, the answer to that specifically. I'm unfamiliar with the connected network, but it, uh, it will be part of the Green Lots uh, network. That's, um, I believe, all the fast chargers in British Columbia aside from, from Tesla are on that network. It will be available to the public, so it's not a private fast charger. It's available to everyone. Great. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, next question is for Eric um, from Jimmy. Do you always need to charge vehicles to 100% before the next driver takes them out, or do you have for taking out the vehicle at less than 100% in some cases? So in our models, um, we're able to determine how what the state of charge would be at the end of a, a night, given how much time there is left to charge, and the sort of starting uh, state of charge uh, for for the night. So we're able to determine if they're going to start the next day with a full state of charge in the modeling software, and that actually is how we determine the charge capable score. Um, now. In in general, sort of more broadly outside of doing an EV suitability assessment, generally we are encouraging fleets to um, to have a full state of charge when they begin the day because it just gives them the extra electric kilometers that they can travel, whether it's a plug-in hybrid or an all-electric. Found that through the study that we've been doing over the years, that the average dwell time in a fleet is about 14 hours overnight, so that's plenty of time to to fully recharge a battery. So generally speaking, um, you know most fleets do start start the day with a full state of charge if they're diligent about plugging in the vehicle. Thank you, Eric. Uh, unfortunately, we've we've come to the end of the webinar today. There's still a few questions, and we'll follow up with the presenters on those. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, today. Uh, the webinar will, uh, has been recorded and will be made available online.